I think we are recording, maybe. Yeah, do you see, do you see it on your end? Yes, I do. Oh, that's exciting. Technology is the best. Cool. Okay. All righty. Um, take it away. You got it. Hi, everybody. I'd like to invite us all to just take in a really nice deep breath. Because I know we've all been probably looking at Zoom screens quite a bit today, or we're just going through different levels of stress. So I think that a deep breath is a good idea. And I'd like to begin by offering a welcome. I'd like to welcome people of all genders. This may include people who identify as women, men, trans, genderqueer, or others. I would like to welcome people of African descent, Black, African American, Asian descent, Arab descent, and people of European descent. I'd like to welcome those who identify as Hispanic, Latinx, people indigenous to this land, and people of mixed, multiple descents. I would like to welcome people who are present here today who have disabilities, those disabilities that are visible and the not so visible. I'd like to welcome gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, gender queer, I'm sorry, queer, or others for whom none of the labels quite fit. I'd like to welcome you in your bodies and the different ways that you may experience yours. I'd like to welcome survivors who are present with us here tonight. I'd like to welcome you and your emotions, whether it's joy and bliss, whether it's confusion or fear or uncertainty, I'd like to welcome you and the energy that you bring tonight, whether you are super excited and ready to dive into what we're gonna talk about tonight, or if you've had a long day and you're a parent raising children or you're a caregiver, or for any reason, your energy levels may be lower, you are most welcome here tonight. I'd like to welcome people of all faith traditions, including those who have traditions that maybe don't reside in a particular faith and friends who may not have a faith or are agnostic or atheist. And finally, I'd like to welcome the ancestors who lived on the land that I am presenting to you from, currently known as Philadelphia. I'd like to welcome the spirits of the Lene Lenape who were the original inhabitants, inhabitants of the land that I'm speaking from before the Europeans came. I'd like to acknowledge them and invite their spirits into this space and extend a general welcome to you all. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about unlocking quirks as superpowers. Uh, the title for the presentation has appeared in different places as unlocking your quirks, unlocking quirks. Uh, feel free to interpret that title in any way that you feel like you can engage with what we're gonna be talking about tonight. We all have things that make us different, unique, and you know, valuable in our communities. And tonight I kind of want to transform the idea that things that we may look at as detractions or quirks are bad things and kind of look at them as things that actually make us who they are and help us be contributors in our own way. So these are my social media handles. If you'd like to follow me on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And it's the same for just about all of them except for Facebook. So for Facebook, it's Marta from Philly. Uh, I also like to invite people during my talks, if you like my work and if it's meaningful to you and you'd like to see me do more of it, um, I do have an account with buymeacoffee.com. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash Marta Russick, my full name. Um, yeah, I also like to point out that um, People like me on the autism spectrum, it can be really difficult in many situations to find a job or to earn income. So I think it's especially important to talk about how important it is to support the work of people like me. So if you're moved by what you hear tonight, please toss a coin to your presenter. And I have a couple of housekeeping uh, things of my own. Um, so for me, uh, Mikey is going to be monitoring the chat um, so that that's a little less distraction for me because unfortunately if lights are blinking or things are going off, um, it can uh, kind of take me out of the space that I'm in and I lose my space. So to avoid that from happening, I'm not going to check the chat. Uh, I would also ask that we hold questions to the end. 
And I know that that can be really difficult. And I know it's been difficult for me when I get a direction like that. So the suggestion that I offer people is if there's a burning question that you have, jot it down. And um, that way you'll have it as soon as we get to the Q&A section. And um, feel free as we go along to put those questions in as you think of them too. Then that way, when we get to the end for Q&A, which I'll try to leave a lot of time for, uh, Mikey can let me know what wonderful questions you have. If um, anything is uh, up, up for asking questions around, if I don't feel comfortable answering a question, I will certainly let you know. But go ahead and ask questions that you really would like to know about what my experience is like, and if there are strategies that I would suggest when it comes to creating a welcoming environment that helps people who are autistic like me. I also use this opportunity to um, issue a kind of disclaimer, which is I am speaking about my personal experiences as a person on the autism spectrum, though my experiences should not be treated as generalizations or as a representation of the experiences of all people who are autistic. Um, the name uh, Autism Spectrum Disorder is so for a reason, because there is a spectrum of experiences, and some people require a little bit more support than others. So uh, I'll share that at the top of things. And I think we can dive right in. So one thing that I like to do with this presentation is kind of get a baseline from people for um, what their familiarity is with the topic that we're about to talk about. So you should have the ability to draw on this screen or write words on it. I believe that Mikey said that he had made the screen engageable. Uh, so my question for you all that I'd love to see you jot your answers down on the screen for is when you think of autism or hear slash read autism spectrum disorder, what words, ideas, and pop culture references leap to mind? And we'll take just about two minutes if people want to write those thoughts out. Socially awkward, yeah, that's a big one. Great with numbers. So I see parenthood, that's a lovely one. Yeah, good doctor, yep, so that's a TV show. Oh, I'm sorry, parenthood, the TV show. I have not familiarized myself with that yet, but I have been told that it is a show that's worth watching. Awesome, Let's see if I can move these videos down here. Taking things literally, yes, that is definitely an experience I have. Rain Man, that, that always comes up. So if you're still um, looking for the annotation feature, so mouse up to view options, then click um, the third option down, which is annotate, you'll get this um, kind of bar to do stuff. Um, and then you can click um, text um, in that bar or draw. Hmm, not everyone has the option. Oh no, let me see what I can do. Data and Spock. And thank you, Mikey. I appreciate you jumping in. Great with numbers. I, <laughs> I wish I could say that was my experience. Uh, we'll get to that during the presentation that uh, um, the way our minds work, uh, some people are really great with numbers who are on the autism spectrum. Uh, my thing that I'm really into that I have a long memory for is movies and movie quotes. Yeah, becoming more widely understood, but still a way to go. Unfortunately, that's very true. A movie called Adam. Okay, I haven't heard of that one. I'll have to look into it. Socially awkward fixation. Yes, sensitivities. Absolutely, unique perspective. Atypical, yep. Okay, this is wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the ideas that you've shared. We're going to move on from this, but I promise we're going to ask this question of each other again at the end. And I'm interested, oh, the main wizard guy from Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I would totally agree with that. There's also Tina from Bob's Burgers. There's been speculation that Tina is on the autism spectrum. There's a character in the new Star Trek Discovery uh, I'm still getting into Star Trek, which I know would break my father's heart because he was a huge Star Trek fan. 
when we were growing up, but um, in the new uh, start, yes, Tilly, somebody beat me to it. Yes, uh, many fans have shared um, their uh, belief that Tilly is a member of the autism community. So there's a lot more representation that is happening in pop culture, particularly on TV shows and movies, and that are not as, you know, they're not like Rain Man, where it's repetition or, you know, some of the more um, obvious symptoms. And there's one study partner who dropped out of college. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Unfortunately, the education system can be a very scary and overwhelming place for folks like me. I'm still amazed that I got through school, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second. Great. So we're going to pause this here, and we're going to keep moving, but I thank you all for the thoughts that you have shared here. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can clear. All right. Let's keep it moving. All right. So I want to tell you about a day that happened to me back in 2013, AKA the normal day that suddenly wasn't. So back in 2013, I wasn't living in Philadelphia at the time, which is where I am you know, broadcasting from right now. I uh, commuted to Philly on weekends to visit my family. And on this particular weekend back in 2013, I was reading a newspaper that was on the mega bus or that I had found near it. And one of the articles that I stumbled upon was about a man who had struggled his entire life with social interactions, communicating with others, and um, you know, learning problems that he was experiencing. And it piqued my interest and I was reading it. And one of the features of the article was a list of all this man's symptoms. And you know, started reading different things on it and realized by the time that I got to the end of that list that I had just about every symptom on that list. And this is not the list that was in that article. Um, this is an image uh, entitled Autism Signs in Adults That May Have Been Missed as Kids. So there's social signs, sensory signs, behavioral signs, and communication signs. The source of this graphic is autisticmama.com. So the condition that this man was talking about, as you may have guessed, was autism spectrum disorder, which becomes adult autism spectrum disorder when somebody receives a diagnosis when they are an adult. So some of the symptoms here were things that I experienced as a kid. So I was a very picky eater. Um, I would get very overwhelmed and have meltdowns if I was in you know, social situations that had a lot of people or if there was a particular noise that was happening. Um, I struggle with uh, broken routines, you know, broken rules, things that are um, kind of there as guidelines. It can be really uncomfortable for me when those guidelines are suddenly interrupted or those routines are interrupted. One symptom that I didn't realize was associated with autism that I found out about in the last couple of months is selective muteness. So you may hear that um, there are a lot of young children with autism who do not speak at all. They are nonverbal. Um, it is possible that a child may be selectively nonverbal. Um, for me, I would only speak between the hours of three and four o'clock in the afternoon. To this day, we don't know why that was, but that continued until about the age of four. And uh, then I was able to kind of break out of that routine and I spoke much more freely. But uh, starting with that day in 2013, I really you know, had all these different quirks and didn't realize that these were symptoms of something larger, something that merited intervention, whether it was going to a therapist or you know, getting a diagnosis. And I'll be honest and say it was kind of scary because it's something that uh, I had heard a lot about, but um, all the things that I had heard about autism were overwhelmingly negative. So when you are coming to the realization that you may have something that has an overwhelmingly negative view in the world. It's something that people are not happy about or that they, they don't really like talking about. It can be pretty scary to suddenly have the realization that you might have that too. So I like to show this picture because this is kind of my evolution from you know a little girl to a kid in school who struggled profoundly with education and with uh, classrooms and things of that nature to the person who, um, this was taken in 2014, so about a year after I had read that article and the realization was really starting to sink in 
that I may be a person on the autism spectrum. And I show this for a couple of reasons. But the main one is that uh, one negative piece of feedback that I get on a regular basis when I disclose my status as a person on the autism spectrum is, oh, you don't look like somebody who has autism. And I understand that it is a well-intentioned phrase that that person is delivering that, wow, you know, you don't look like you need any additional help and I never would have detected that you were somebody on the autism spectrum. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, what that actually is, is a, um, it's, it's a reference to normalcy and white supremacy. The idea that if you are not normal looking and if normal is white, middle class, straight, all these other things that, we, that um, the mainstream society considers quote unquote normal, it can be really scary to be left out of that. Um, so I like to lovingly challenge that mindset whenever people say something like that to me because while they think it might be a compliment, it really isn't. Um, so hopefully if you ever hear somebody sharing something like that with another person, you can lovingly say, well, what does a person with autism look like? Or, you know, maybe there's another way of you know, sharing that you're astonished right now. Like even just saying, I never knew that about you and I appreciate you sharing that with me. So that is that. So with our presentation tonight, we're going to look at, I'm just going to go back up for just a second. We're going to take a look at some of these things that, you know, a lot of people may know as quirks or things that are undesirable. And I'm going to flip that for you. I'm going to prioritize talking about five quote unquote quirk, uh, quirks that I um, have grown up with and lived with for most of my life that, you know, are an indication that I may be a person on the autism spectrum, but I view them as something like a superpower, something that helps me thrive in a world that really wasn't built for people like me, but I still want to participate in it and do my darndest to be part of it. And the way that we're going to go over these quirks is I'm going to tell you, um, you know, the name of the actual quirk slash superpower. I'm going to tell you how it's a benefit to me. And then I'm also going to tell you how it might be overused and what to be mindful of when that might appear in my life or when that appears in the life of somebody that you might know. And we're going to start with something called um, empathy vision. And I like to call empathy vision, you know, shining the bat signal. So there's an image here of uh, Batman standing next to the bat signal in the Gotham sky while it's raining outside. Um, so basically it's, um, it's me taking on different causes or missions because I know what it feels like to be left out and to not feel wanted and feel like I have so much to give, but nobody is really listening. So with Empathy Vision, what it looks like in my life, um, I work for a couple of different mission-driven organizations. Um, I've done a lot of volunteer work. Right now I'm a volunteer for the American Red Cross here in Philly. They're a great organization and they're still open and helping families that are experiencing crisis um, as a result of disasters or fires or things like that. You should totally look them up. Um, I'm the lead organizer for Nonprofit Nerds Philly, which is a group that empowers current and aspiring nonprofit professionals in the Philadelphia area through networking and also skill sharing. So we have events that um, are free to the public and anybody who considers themselves a nonprofit nerd can be there and we basically share skills together. I co-created this group with somebody else because there wasn't really anything like that in Philly that was free and accessible to anybody who wanted to partake in it. So I went ahead and did that because uh, I struggled with finding work and even finding work in the nonprofit sector. So I wanted to create an entity that would make it easier so that nobody else had to go through the frustration and heartache that I did. Uh, the dark side of um, empathy vision is exhaustion. So I'll take a moment to um, probably answer a question that a couple of people have here right now, which is, well, what does it feel like to be an autistic person? And the easiest way that I can describe it that it seems to resonate with people is imagining that you are at a concert, like with loud music that never ends. Um, you're surrounded by people and that can be overwhelming. Uh, you're, you have heightened senses that take in more information than most of the people around you. So 
If you imagine being at a concert where there are loud sounds happening nonstop, there are blinking lights, there are lots of different smells going on because you know everybody has their own life experience and has different smells that they bring with them. When you have all of that happening nonstop, where you're always hearing noises that no one else is hearing, or you're hearing them several decibels louder than everybody else is hearing them, you're smelling things, your um, lights are much more brighter to you than they probably would be for most people. Having that happen to you all the time can already make you really tired. Uh, there are days that I'll joke with people and say, I wanted to come to your party or I wanted to come to your Zoom call, but I had used up all my spoons that day. There was an article about um, the spoon theory, and I'm drawing a blank on the wonderful woman who wrote it, but I can share that with Mikey so that we can distribute that to you all after this is over. But the spoon theory is kind of a way of explaining while everybody else has endless spoons and they have endless energy and um, you know the ability to do a lot of different things, for me, I may have only three to four spoons in a given day, and if I have to use two of those spoons to get ready for work, that means that I only have one or two spoons left in the rest of the day to get me through it. So um, that exhaustion can definitely keep me removed from the activities that I like to be doing. It can keep me away from the people I love, um, and it can also create a feeling of guilt. I've noticed that with the current situation that we're all in, a lot of people have been sharing that they're experiencing extreme drowsiness and they just feel tired all the time or they're having trouble focusing all the time. And in a kind of weird twisted way, I like to let people know like that's kind of how it can feel for somebody like me, where you're just tired all the time and focusing is really tough. So, as awful as this time is, my hope when we all emerge out of it is that um, the new normal is a greater acceptance of people for whom life is already really exhausting. And knowing how you felt when your boss said to you, you know, I totally get that you're tired and that it's hard to focus right now. Do what you think you can do and we'll make the work happen as best we can. So I'll encourage you to hold on to that nugget of understanding as we go along. So our next uh, quirk slash superpower that I like to talk about is hypervigilant. Uh, this is, or hypervigilance, uh, this is the idea that um, you're super observant. I like to tell people about my interesting observation that I usually can tell when people have had a haircut, which just seems like a, <laughs> a funny thing to notice. But uh, sure enough, you know, when we were all still in the office and uh, you know, around each other at the job that I work at during the day, I could always tell when somebody had put on makeup or gotten their hair cut. Uh, to this day, I don't know if I'll use my haircut recognizing abilities as a power for good or evil. I don't know if there's a way to recognize evil haircuts, but we shall see. Uh, so with empathy vision, um, you know when things are changing. And the person that I like to point to for this particular quirk is uh, Sherlock. In this case, it's uh, Benedict Cumberbatch playing Sherlock. There's a screenshot of uh, Sherlock kind of looking thoughtfully at the camera. Uh, there's also a screenshot here of um, a scene from one of the episodes of the new Sherlock series where Sherlock is able to tell just by looking at somebody if they're a parent, if they smoke cigarettes, what their nationality is because he's learned to associate different details with different lifestyles and different things that he's seen in his day-to-day -day life. Uh, apparently Benedict Cumberbatch played that character um, with a mind to somebody on the autism spectrum, which I always found very interesting because it kind of shows a positive portrayal of somebody that, um, you know, they may have struggles and they may experience meltdowns, but they have some pretty substantial gifts that they contribute to the experiences of the people around them, like finding somebody that's committed a crime or seeing that somebody is in trouble because you notice that their hair is disheveled and things don't seem right. Um, the dark side when it comes to hypervigilance is um, checking in too much. So people like to know that you care, but when you do it over and over and over again, it can start to be repetitive and feel uncomfortable, like surveillance. So the way that I've learned to cope with this and not check in too much, like, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? All the time is you know, I'll, I'll do greetings with people when I first talk to them or first see them in the morning. 
and then let them really come to me. You know, if somebody's having a bad day or if somebody is having a drastic life change, um, when you let somebody know once, hey, I'm here for you, if there's anything that you want to talk about or if there's anything that's really bugging you that we can go over together, I'm always here and open and I'd like to help you. So letting somebody know once that you care and that your door is always open goes a long way. Next quirk for me slash superpower is fearless fixing. And I'm gonna go right to the image of my superhero for this, which, um, who is Shuri from uh, Black Panther. Uh, Shuri is a problem solver. So whenever there is something that's not working or there's a better way of doing it, Shuri is on it. I'm kind of the same way. Whenever there is a new process that could be developed or an answer to a problem that is kind of bugging everybody, I'm usually the person that wants to figure that out. Um, the example that I like to point to is a couple of years ago, I was um, very concerned about uh, the Affordable Care Act and the fact that the current administration had slashed the advertising budget for the open enrollment period for health insurance by 90%. I wanted to make sure that people could get insurance and know that the open enrollment period was still happening in spite of everything that was going on. So I created Get Covered Philly, which was a grassroots campaign to make people aware of the open enrollment period and what their options were for health insurance. Um, Get Covered Philly is still going on. It hasn't been as active given the current state of things, but I do you know, use the website and the social media pages occasionally to let people know about you know, what's going on with healthcare and what they can do to get covered Philly. So, I'm going to keep moving here. And you'll notice I keep referring to notes. For me, uh, unfortunately, uh, short-term memory is not great. So um, I'm always taking ample notes when I do my presentations um, because it helps me remember the key points that I really want to address whenever I give my presentations. Uh, when I am at work, if I'm in a meeting, I will be the person who is taking detailed notes. And what's been nice is the people that I work with find this to be a very valuable asset. The idea that somebody is in there taking notes, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting or a phone call, knowing that there's going to be a record afterwards of what we talked about um, is something that universally people I work with or interact with outside of the office have said that's a really valuable way to approach that. So I encourage you, if you are somebody who is like me and struggles with short-term memory or um, you have a lot of record skip moments, as I like to call them, I don't like to call something a senior moment because as we all know, you don't have to be a senior citizen in order to have a moment where you just think, why was I in this room? Or why did I open that email? Or why did, I, why did I go to my car just now? So if you find that you too have lots of record skip moments, taking notes and writing things down can be a very valuable skill to develop. So the dark side of fearless fixing is something that is directly related to white supremacy and that is perfectionism. Now I'm gonna pause for a second because a lot of people might be asking themselves, well, what exactly do you mean when you're talking about white supremacy? Because I think that the image a lot of people get in their minds when they hear that phrase is people in white hoods burning crosses like the KKK. And the unfortunate reality is that white supremacy, it, it is not just something as overt as I'm wearing an outfit and doing something offensive in order to let people know where I stand on certain issues. It's the idea that um, somebody values white culture. Again, the idea of normalcy. If um, white culture is the right culture or the only thing that you prefer to align yourself with or that you like to emphasize, that is white supremacy. Perfectionism is a form of white supremacy because um, the idea is that you are erasing any imperfections and trying to elevate yourself in such a way so that it looks like you fit in or that there's nothing wrong. And for many years, even after I got my diagnosis in 2015, I had this inclination of I must be perfect at all times. If I ever do anything that is imperfect or I let people know who I really am, I will not be welcome. I will be alone and I will be ostracized. And I know for a fact that that is not true. 
unfortunately, there still is a drive for things must be perfect. Um, they must appear a certain way at all times. And we can't have any deviations from that. And with perfectionism, it also insists that there is a solution for everything. And the fact is, there are some uncomfortable moments of life where there is no solution. And I think that being comfortable with letting go of there is no solution for this particular situation, it's something we can keep working towards so that we have a resolution that benefits as many people as possible. But when we let go of the idea that every single problem must have a solution and we have to do it right now, it really frees people's creativity, it lessens stress, and it helps refocus the goal. Because if you're not trying to be perfect all the time, you're able to see, well, well, what are ways that I could actually make this better? Where can I invite collaboration? Where can I invite different viewpoints into this? Just because we're used to doing something a certain way and we recognize that maybe it doesn't work so well, we can invite different ideas into the circle and we can create something that's even better than the normal that we had before. So that's my piece on perfectionism. So this probably, this is anxiety. This is probably something that a lot of people are thinking to themselves, oh my God, this is a superpower I already have. And you're right, a lot of people have anxiety. And for me, um, there's a continuum with anxiety, whether it is like a straight jacket or a starter pistol. And for some people, anxiety can be really restricting and it can keep them from doing the things that they really want to be doing. Um, when I gave this talk a couple of years ago at bar camp in 2018, getting out of bed that morning was horrifically difficult because I was nervous. Again, perfectionism. What if this isn't perfect? What if people heckle me while I'm trying to give this talk? What if I get something horribly wrong or I say the wrong words? But I was able to use that anxiety to motivate me and say, this is how you know you're on the right track. You're scared right now. So you're gonna use that fear to get your butt out of bed and get on the bus and go to John Huntsman Hall and you are gonna deliver the hell out of this presentation because if you're having this kind of anxiety and fear over what this could mean, there are so many people out there who have fears and anxieties around um, the unknown and what it means to be a person on the autism spectrum. And I'll tell you, every single time I have given this talk, there is at least one person who reaches out to me or comes up to me afterwards, back when I was doing it in person, who will say, I'm noticing that a lot of these symptoms are in my own life, and I'd like to ask you about your experience of getting a diagnostic test. Or it will be, I think my brother-in-law or somebody who's close to me or somebody that I work with exhibits a lot of these quirks that you were talking about today, and I think they too might be on the spectrum. Um, so I'll, I'll welcome the opportunity if anybody wants to ask me later in our Q&A what you can do when that situation happens, please do. We'll have a good conversation about it. But in this particular situation, um, I call myself a pessimistic optimist because of anxiety. And what that means is I plan, like I'll rehearse conversations in my head sometimes so that I don't say the wrong thing or so that I don't say anything that might cause pain. Um, I'll plan the heck out of trips or, you know, even trips to go to the pharmacy to get medicine. You know, there might be, I have to plan which route I want to take or how long it's going to take and stuff like that. So I over plan because I'm always expecting that something bad or something really inconvenient that could throw off my routine is going to happen. Um, because again, routines, they're kind of important to me because the disruption to a routine can be really catastrophic for me. And brings me to this picture of uh, what about Bob? So my pessimistic optimism and my anxiety are like my raincoat. Even if it's not raining outside, I'm planning for rain so that I know what my plans C, D, E, and F are. So if I you know, run out of plan B and C, I know exactly where I'm gonna go next and get that done. I'm gonna pause for a second because there's one really important thing that we should talk about as it relates to anxiety, and that is meltdowns. So somebody, I think if memory serves, mentioned in our original slide, meltdowns. And uh, to describe a meltdown, I like to use a picture of this guy. This is the Incredible Hulk from uh, the um, Avengers series. 
So a meltdown is very different than a tantrum. A lot of people confuse the two. A tantrum is something that a person, regardless of age, may use in order to achieve a desired goal by having a tantrum. A meltdown is not a tantrum because it's a complete loss of emotional control. It's usually the result of overstimulation. So if there is a noise happening out in the distance while I'm on a video call, I may have to excuse myself because it's becoming overwhelming. I can't focus and it's causing my blood pressure to go up and I know that a meltdown is coming. Um, meltdowns can look very, 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 very different depending on who is experiencing it. For me, it manifests itself as intense crying and um, sometimes I have a real short temper where I might just yell and say things I really don't mean because I'm overloaded and I need to get away. Fortunately, in the years since I've had my diagnosis, I have been able to anticipate and recognize the signs that a meltdown is coming, but I'm not always successful. There was a time last year when I was at a pretty important meeting for my job and I had a meltdown in front of the entire room. What made it a little less crummy was the fact that my boss, my colleagues, and some of the volunteers in the room knew about my history and they were aware that I could experience meltdowns from overstimulation, like being at a large event where there's a lot of people and a lot of sensory information coming in. So it was actually quite beautiful to have people sit with me and reassure me that it was going to be okay. Um, because it can be a really scary, disorienting experience of having a meltdown. For me, it also, it's like draining all the battery out of my personal iPhone battery or draining all the energy out of my personal battery. Because it does, it's like a surge in energy and then suddenly you don't have any. So it can be really bad if I have a meltdown in a public place because I may not be able to walk or I may not be able to get home on my own. So I'll also take this opportunity to share three basic strategies that I can recommend to you that you may want to use if you notice somebody experiencing a meltdown. This does assume that you either just met the person or know the person. Since everybody experiences meltdowns differently, it's really important to start by validating that person's feelings. Um, there was a story that was on the news a couple of years ago about a little boy who was waiting in line to see the Spider-Man ride at Universal Studios. And I think that this was the second day in a row they had tried to go on the ride because there was a malfunction the day before or the, the ride closed, something like that. The second day that this little boy was waiting in line, you know, for hours because those lines can be long, they get to the front of the line and suddenly it's announced that the ride cannot be open for the rest of the day. Something has happened and it's just closed. This little boy just kind of fell on the ground and was sobbing and was having a full on meltdown. And fortunately, there was a staff member who had a relative that was on the autism spectrum she laid down next to this little guy and said, you did such a great job waiting for this ride. And I am really sorry that you weren't able to go on it today. And that made a huge deal in lessening the, the trauma of the experience and the impact of the experience because this little boy had an ally there with him that was able to and willing to go on this journey with him. So she validated his feelings she also helped him feel safe on his terms. So she didn't touch him. It's really a bad idea to touch somebody on the autism spectrum who is having a meltdown because it can be dangerous. And also a lot of people who are on the autism spectrum do not like to be touched. I'm not one of them. I like to get hugs, you know, when hugs are safe again, but always a good idea to ask somebody if you're going into their space, if that's okay for you to do. In that particular situation, the person who was working at Universal Studios lay down next to the little boy and said, you take as much time as you need, just cry it out. Um, if you need me to get you anything, just let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna just be right here with you until you feel comfortable to stand up again. And that made a huge difference to him and his family. Um, so the last item here is when the person is calm again, helping them create a safety plan. In that particular instance, the, um, the resolution was the person at Universal Studios actually got Spider-Man to come out and talk to the little boy and say, you're a superhero, 
you're, you're so good for waiting in line. I'm really sorry that we couldn't give you the experience you wanted today, but I'm so glad that you're here. And I think that they may have gotten tickets to go see a future version of the ride. I can't remember for sure, but um, Google that story. It's a, it's a really good one. And it just shows that when people are aware of what autism looks like, what a meltdown looks like, and what it means to create safety for somebody who is experiencing a meltdown, it can lead to really positive results, both for the person having the experience of a meltdown and for the people around that experience so that it shows that even though this is uncomfortable, it's not something that is unmanageable and it's not something that's scary. It's just something that we need a greater understanding of. The last skill that I want to, or a quirk I should say, that I wanna talk with you all about is resilience. I like to describe resilience as a, um, it's like having a ridiculously obnoxious form of hope at all times. And for me, I learned the most about resilience from working with Women Against Abuse, which is a really wonderful nonprofit organization that serves survivors of um, intimate partner violence and essentially all forms of um, control and abuse that might happen in a relationship, whether it's emotional abuse, sexual, financial, which is definitely a form of abuse. Um, with resilience, it's this idea that you've gone through something profound and life-changing and maybe not great, but having the hope that it is going to get better and that the sun will shine again is, it's just, it's helpful. Resilience is also a form of um, laying the groundwork so that the people who come to an experience, a place of business or anything after you've been through it, have an easier time of acclimatizing and understanding it. And for that reason, the person that I like to point to as a symbol of resilience is um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And uh, I can't see you all at the moment, but I'm hoping a lot of people are smiling. Uh, Justice Ginsburg became known as the great dissenter um, later on in her tenure because she is now serving on a predominantly conservative Supreme Court. And with her, she recognizes that um, resilience means writing really effective dissenting opinions that can be used by lawyers and lawmakers and judges in the years to come. Because if she had said nothing and just let these decisions that were in conflict with her own interpretation of the law and her own morals, if they were allowed to go unchallenged without a dissenting opinion that can help people later, then it would be justice denied for so many people that really need the change and they need the laws to be on their side. Um, but with the different opinions where she was able to write her dissent, it paves the way for things to be changed later. So I like to let people know that um, even though it can be pretty crummy when the law seems to fail the people that it's designed to protect, always look for somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the background who is writing a dissenting opinion or building a case that can challenge the legality of something later. And I also like to share this shot of uh, Justice Ginsburg doing planking because, you know, I, I can never do a plank like that. And man, I wish I could. So those are the five quirks I want to talk to you about real quick before we get into our, um, our Q&A session. Um, I'd like to give you some tips on how to survive having superpowers or quirks, however you want to recognize them, without really trying. The first one is to get a sidekick. And for me, there's a couple of different kinds of sidekicks. Primarily, you can have somebody like Robin, you know, who was sidekick to Batman, somebody who's down in the trenches with you and is fighting side by side, fighting the good fight with you. Um, this can be a best friend, it can be your spouse or partner, um, it can be your kids, or you can be the sidekick for your kid if you have a child who is autistic. Um, on the flip side, there can also be a sidekick like Alfred, who was like a, a father figure to Batman after um, his parents were murdered when he was a kid. Um, in the real world, Alfred can look like a therapist or a mentor or somebody in a professional setting who, you know, doesn't, they care about your development, but they also know it's important to be impartial and give you advice that you can hear and that you can use in order to make a difference in your life. 
Um, this week I actually had a really great experience where somebody had to give me feedback and because they were like a sidekick to me, I was able to hear the feedback and take action so that I was able to avoid the problem that I was finding myself in over and over again. And I usually don't make this note in my talks, but I will say that um, it is really important to give feedback to somebody, especially if you think they're like me and they're on the autism spectrum. I can't tell you how many times in the years before my diagnosis, I felt like there was a joke that everybody was in on, but I wasn't. Uh, there were also times where, you know, I was kind of awkward and I may have said or done things that um, rubbed people the wrong way or were not a good fit for the environment that I was in. But unfortunately, I never got that feedback. And I think part of it is because we all assume, well, they'll get the message eventually. They'll understand that, um, you know, nobody's talking to them or they're not getting promoted or, you know, it'll just occur to them later that their behavior needs to be rectified or what they're saying is offensive and they'll just stop. Uh, I'm sure that this is not limited to folks on the autism spectrum, but knowing that there is a behavior that I am doing or if somebody I care about is doing, I would actually prefer to have the feedback delivered so that I can fix it and not cause pain. It hurts me very deeply knowing that in my attempt to connect with people and you know make friendships and make lasting relationships, that there might be something that I'm doing that is causing harm or causing somebody to not feel comfortable around me. So I'll always lovingly say, if um, you have a good enough relationship with somebody where you can take them aside at a time that works for their schedule and say, I wanted to share a noticing with you. I noticed that when we're at this meeting that sometimes you do X, Y, or Z. I care about you and I want you to do well. And I noticed that that's been happening and I wanted to ask if you could stop doing it so that um, it doesn't cause interference with the meetings that we're having. And then you're good. Next step is to know your kryptonite. So know the things that are limiting to you and know um, the things that are maybe holding you back. Like I was saying a moment ago, um, being open to feedback and knowing the things that are going to be limiting to you can actually help you to work around them so that you're still able to make an impact. Earlier, I mentioned that my short-term memory isn't great. And my workaround for that was taking detailed notes when I was in a meeting and then sharing them with the person that I was in a meeting with. This is great because it's a record of the discussion that happened so that, you know, if the other person is having a low energy day and they can't remember, did we say that we were going to make that poster blue or did we say we were gonna make it purple? You can look in the notes and say, we definitely agreed that it was gonna be blue. And now you both have that clarity and you have a point of reference. Sharing notes is also helpful because if you got something wrong, Sometimes while I'm typing, I might mishear something or I don't hear something at all because my brain is focused on, I need to write these notes out. Sharing notes with somebody gives them the opportunity to tell me, actually, we had talked about this and I noticed that it wasn't in the notes. Could you go ahead and add it? And then you're good. And then lastly, uh, this is important. Remember that you're not the only mutant. And to illustrate this point, I like to reference a quote from Fred Rogers, and the quote is, anything that is human is mentionable, and anything that is mentionable is manageable. So once you give a name to the obstacles that you're facing or the feelings that you have that are keeping you from blossoming into the wonderful person that you are and that you deserve to achieve in yourself, it can really be a lot easier to put a name on it and say, I'm going to work on that or I'm gonna try not to do that anymore so that the people around me feel comfortable and I can have deeper, more fulfilling relationships. Um, I'll also share that not everybody realizes that they're different. And there's that phrase um, that people are, a lot of people are fighting a battle that you know nothing about. That's really true, particularly if it's somebody who is like me, back in 2013 who just read a list that confirmed for them that they were a person on the autism spectrum. It can be really difficult, scary, and downright impossible for somebody to confront the reality that they may have a disability or they may have something that could drastically change their life experience. So having that compassion in the back of your mind and in your heart at all times when you are interacting with people 
who might be a little bit different. They might struggle to fit in. They might struggle with the work that they're doing. If you can be the ally to that person who lets them know that they're not alone, that their contributions to the office are valuable, and that you appreciate having them around, it makes it reminds them that they're not the only person with different abilities that's in the office and that they are you know, truly wanted and needed in the workplace. And I also like to throw in this uh, uh, picture from, uh, what is it, um, Legally Blonde? I almost said Beautifully Blonde, which is true too. Uh, but with Legally Blonde, Elle Woods delivers a commencement address to her class at the end where she says the first impressions are not always correct. And for people like me, that's really true, especially if you're meeting me right after I had a meltdown or if you're meeting me when I'm in the process of having a meltdown and I need to run out of the room and go to the bathroom and get my bearings so that it doesn't become a problem that is uh, visible to everybody. So just be kind to people. And if the first interaction doesn't go well, give them another chance. Assume that maybe something really crummy was going on in their orbit at that exact moment. And by giving them another chance, you're giving them the ability to forge new relationships and to better themselves and to stay connected to the world around them, which is super important, especially right now. So we're gonna get back into our interactive phase here. Now that you have experienced this presentation, I'd love to know um, what leaps to mind when you think of autism or autism spectrum disorder. Hyper awareness, very good. Empathy, yes. Hearts, love it. Analytical, yes. These are they're, all of these are good words and good symbols to use growing. That's very true. I'll mention that I used to work at the Apple store. So uh, fortunately or unfortunately, as the case may be, I've been trained in how to deal with uncomfortable silence. Oh, independent thinkers, that's a good one. Highly varied from person to person, absolutely. That is true. Give it maybe one more minute. If anybody has any final thoughts that they wanna share. If you wanna mention any of the superheroes we talked about or how to help a person with a meltdown, that's totally fine too. I'll take a sip of water. You can tell I'm from Philly, I say water. Sherlock Holmes, very nice. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, my hope is um, as the world becomes more accepting of people on the autism spectrum, um, that we will, you know, see. Um, that we will be able to see you know, a wider range of characters. Like I mentioned at the top that Tina on Bob's Burgers and somebody had confirmed that Tilly from uh, Discovery for Star Trek are both characters that are on the autism spectrum. Oh, this is an interesting, harder to corrupt in politics. That's something that I don't usually include in the, um, the presentation, but I will say that lying because I have horrible short-term memory is something I do not do. <laughs> Um, maybe little white lies if someone is like, hey, what do you think? And you don't want to hurt their feelings and you say it looks, it looks like it's you. Um, but uh, yeah, the lying thing and is, you know, basically by being committed to transparency and creating nurturing experiences for the people around me, I do find that lying or um, allowing anything corruptive into my life is 
is really not, you know, not possible. It's something I don't like. Doctor Strange, both played by Cumberbatch, yes. I like this one. Meltdown support. Understand the person is not in control, so there's no need to get angry or upset by the meltdown. It is not an intended event. High five to whoever put that down. That is one of the most succinct, effective ways I've ever heard it described. So thank you. May hulk out, but having a Black Widow there, like, oh, that is adorable. Another high five for the friend that put that there. Well, this has been wonderful. Superpower. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. If anyone wants to put down one or two more thoughts, and then um, we will move on to the question and answer section, which has always been the best part of my presentation, is hearing the questions that you have. Whoops. Get that away. There we go. All right. Well, let us move along. Uh, well, maybe I'll just keep your, your comments up there. It's fun. Uh, so um, just a friendly reminder, if you want to connect with me on social media, I am at Marta from Philly on Facebook, at Marta Russick on Twitter, and at Marta Russick for both, um, for all Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. So if you want to find me, um, connect with me, ask me any questions that you have about my experiences or suggestions for what you might be able to do if you're in a situation involving somebody on the autism spectrum or you know what words to use if you're a marketer or other things that you can do to be an encouraging presence for somebody who's on the autism spectrum i'm always open to hearing those questions so we're gonna clear this get out of here oh it's so fun to use zoom ah oh no let me go back into here all right Let's go. Okay, so with Buddy the Elf here, I love questions. Questions are my favorite. So let's get to some questions. Mikey, what do you have? Or Alex, whoever wants to feed them to me. Hello, hello. Um, hello. I still had the like editor bar for typing on the screen and couldn't get back to my controls. Um, okay, so we did have a couple questions came in um, during the chat. I'm gonna scroll up, make sure that I have them all. Question from Katie um, sp regarding spoons. Do you find occasions where you give this presentation uh, deplete your energy, where you give this presentation deplete your energy or add to your, sp to your spoons for the day? because it's an opportunity to share and help people understand your experience? That is such a cool question. And the answer is there are, have been times where I do gain spoons from doing this presentation. Uh, and I think that that's something that's important to share with people is that there are times when you can get the spoons back. And um, the way that I get spoons is knowing that I am supported, uh, knowing that um, people are understanding of the fact that I, you know, might have diminished energy because I've had a meltdown or, you know, because, you know, there's a loud noise happening outside my window and I'm not able to get work done the way that I want to get them done. Learning something can definitely give me a spoon or two as well. Um, I am very sensitive about the fact that um, sometimes I'm perceived as aloof or stupid because I ask a lot of questions or sometimes it just takes me a few goings over of something before it actually sticks in my brain for what is being asked of me. So if you ever see me in a, um, a meeting or a presentation in the future and I say the words, may I ask a clarifying question or can you run that by me one more time? It means that I really want to understand what's being talked about so that I can be um, a, a solid contributor of the group that's putting that project together or so that I can support my colleagues and not being shamed for that and having people affirm, oh yeah, that, that's a, I'm glad that you're asking me to clarify this because there are some things that I'm still working out too. Um, that means the world to me. It means that I'm welcome, that I'm accepted and that my work matters. So that's, that's a couple of ways that I get spoons in addition to doing a presentation like this. Thank you. For asking that question. Um, next question is from Aiden. Uh, I am also autistic and was diagnosed as an adult. 
do you find that getting a diagnosis had hurdles because of outdated views about autism, especially as it relates to gender assigned at birth? Yes, um, I really appreciate this question because uh, women over the age of 18 are the fastest growing group of new diagnoses. When it comes to autism spectrum disorder, a lot of the diagnostic tests are based on boys. And I don't know about um, other people in the room who were raised female, but when I was a little girl, um, it was emphasized that you're supposed to be nice, you're supposed to say yes to everything, um, you're not supposed to make a scene, you're supposed to be accommodating. So when you're taught that you have to be on your best behavior and be perfect, there's that perfectionism thing again, around figures of authority or teachers or you know other people, um, Sorry, there's a helicopter going by. I don't know if that's uh, causing any noise on your end. Um, but to, um, sorry, helicopter noise. <laughs> so again, with noises and any other distractions, it can throw me for a little bit of a loop. And sometimes I'll do what I'm doing right now and talk a little bit until I can find my way back. And now I'm back to the question that's about, you know, did you feel like you overcame, or you experienced any hurdles with getting your diagnosis? So for many years, I had a lot of these symptoms and people just wrote it off as, oh, that's our Marta, you know, just being her wonderful, unique self. And it wasn't until I read that article that I realized, oh, these are all symptoms of a larger situation. When I actually felt ready to get diagnosed, uh, it was a bit of a process. Um, I had to go to my primary care doctor first and say, I think I have autism. And my doctor's response was, thanks for letting me know. I don't have any suggestions for you. And this was back in 2015. So fairly recent. So what ended up happening is I had to do my own research. And I think for, I can't remember exactly if it was two to three months, but it was a couple of months where I really had to, you know, look on Google, find doctors that could actually do the test, which also looks very different for an adult. Because when you're, there's suspicions that you might have um, autism when you're a kid, you know, doctors can observe you in the classroom, they can observe you at home, they can um, observe you, you know, being a kid and kind of take stock of, you know, they're exhibiting symptoms of like, you know, playing with their hands or repetitive behaviors or they don't make eye contact. But for me, it was about the doctor asking me questions about um, my childhood. Did you find that you um, were nonverbal or you didn't speak very much as a kid? Do you ever struggle with eye contact? Do you experience meltdowns? Um, how old were you when you started talking? A lot of things that emphasize talking, which, you know, thankfully I'm, I'm somebody who is able to articulate my needs, but there are a lot of autistic adults who are nonverbal and that might pose a problem if you're trying to diagnose that. So for me, it was after months of searching and um, years of holding that knowledge, I was able to go to a doctor, um, have her ask me a series of questions and her saying, you know, about 20 minutes into this, I had a feeling that this was going to be a diagnosis just based on what you're telling me. I'll also share that um, one of the more pivotal things that happened that actually gave me the courage I needed to go get the diagnostic test was um, a lunch with my boss. Um, I was an intern at a Quaker organization in 2015, and I was having a really great lunch with my boss, and I don't remember exactly what we were talking about, but he created such a feeling of safety where I was able to say out loud for the first time, I think I might be autistic. And unfortunately, I don't remember exactly what he said, but the vibe of it was, if this is something that you need to do for yourself, you should totally do it but I want you to understand that we all love working with you. You contribute so much to our organization and you don't need to prove anything to us. So go do this for yourself. And it's, it sometimes gives me shivers to think about that because imagine if I had had a boss that had said, I hope you never say that to me or anybody else ever again. That could have changed the trajectory of my life where who knows if I'd be giving this presentation to you if I hadn't had lunch with a really good man back in 2015. So should you ever be lucky enough to have somebody feel so safe around you and so empowered to share something that deep with you, I hope that you'll give them a similar string of pearls to say, 
you should go do that if it if it's something that you need to hear but I want you to hear from me directly that I enjoy working with you I enjoy our relationship and you're a wonderful member of our, our team or our community so that they know that this is something that they can do for themselves it's not something that they have to do because of somebody else or you know to fill a need it's just what you what you want so thanks for that question. I know I went on a bit of a tangent with it. Cool. Um, next question also from Aiden. How do you explain meltdowns to someone without sounding like you're using autism as an excuse, especially oh. if you've said things you didn't mean? Gotcha. That's a tough one because there have been like, for example, um, I served in the Peace Corps in 2011 and um, I know that there were times I definitely had meltdowns and it did hurt some of the relationships that I had because I didn't know what was going on and the people around me were just like, this girl is, is just bananas. So if something like that should happen to you, um, I think it's, for me, it's kind of hard to not mention the A word because that, that's the reason why you're having it. And the, you'll hear my training from Women Against Abuse come out. I think that if, um, if anybody's giving you a hard time and saying you're just using that as an excuse, for, like for me, I would be flipping it to say, well, why do you think that having autism is an excuse? Why do you think it's something I choose to have when I don't? And I like to tell people that um, my disability or difference, whatever identifier you feel most comfortable with using when you describe something like that, um, my difference disability condition is not a problem, but the way that the world treats me because of it is a pretty big problem. Um, and I've had to develop a lot of strategies to cope in a world that is really bright, really loud, has lots of smells and has lots of people that do really hurtful things because they don't understand the needs or um, obstacles that the person in front of them has been trying to tackle their whole lives. So for me, I would probably just be direct and say, I, I am a proudly disabled person. My disability in many ways defines who I am and I have come up with strategies to succeed in a world that was not built for somebody like me and one of the things that does happen on occasion is I have a meltdown because I'm in a situation that is not safe for me. And I'd like to talk with you about ways that we can create safer situations for me. And that was a conversation that I had um, with my boss last year after having a meltdown at a very large, important meeting. Um, we created a safety plan so that that wouldn't happen again. At no time did I ever feel shamed or was I ever given a talking to like, you really shouldn't do that in front of this, you know, when we have a big important meeting like that. And that's another reason why I really love the place that I work for, that things that happen to me or experiences that I have that are directly tied with this disability that I have, um, that's just who I am. They, they welcome me for it and they work with me so that I am in a safe situation and able to be a solid contributor at all times. So hopefully that answers your question. If you want to talk more um, after this is over about strategies, I'm, I'm definitely open to that. Cool. Um, we have a question from Sabina here. So she says, um, I loved your story about working with people who understood your quirks and could address your meltdown empathetically. At what point do you usually disclose your autism during a job search process or other Ooh. professional relationship? Oh, goodness. This is a tough question. And I say that because there are some entities like the federal government where they want to know, and you actually can use um, the disclosure of your disability as a way to apply for federal jobs. Um, so if you ever go to usajobs.gov, you can, if there's a particular kind of job that you want in the federal government, you can search by job title, and then you can also filter by show me positions that are open to people who like candidates who are applying who have disabilities that actually helps you it bumps you up on the list of applications that the hiring manager is going to look at first i can't sugarcoat the fact that there have been times where i was actually let go from a job in my probationary period two days after i disclosed to the supervisor that i was an autistic person 
and that still pisses me off to this day. Uh, that does happen, and in Pennsylvania, we are a right-to-work state, which also makes it crummy, so it can be really hard to prove that um, something illegal has happened because it is illegal to discriminate um, on a per based on a person's disability. So I'm the daughter of a really good lawyer, and unfortunately, my father is no longer with us, but a lot of the lessons that he imparted to me are still very present. And one of them is if something seems off or fishy where you're working or in the interactions that you're having in a particular environment, taking notes, keeping records, if somebody sends an email or if you take notes down on a particular day and email it to yourself about an interaction that seemed off to you, um, that's, it's good to have that record so that you know, if anybody ever blames you or says, well, why didn't you say something? You can say, here are all the emails and here are all the interactions. Here's all the things that I filed with you to let you know that something wasn't right because that, that helps your case quite a bit. But when it comes to actually applying for a job, that is personal information for you. If you feel comfortable disclosing it, you totally should. For me, I typically, and there's even an exception to this rule, I typically wait until an offer has been extended to me so that I can say I am a person on the autism spectrum um, and that's what this will look like in your environment. Can we work something out so that I'm able to be an effective team member? But there was a job that I applied for years ago and I was having such a great experience that um, when they asked me the question, how do you feel about diversity? It was like there was another force in the room there with me and I just blurted out, well, as a person with autism spectrum disorder, I think it's damn important. And I got that job. So, <laughs> so you really, it, it depends on a lot of different factors, but um, I think that really stretching out with your feelings, to quote one of my favorite movies, Star Wars, uh, stretching out with your feelings and um, really reading the room and, and wondering, how's this been going so far? And if you are lucky enough to have talked with anybody at that organization before you go in for the interview or you have a friend that works there, asking them, um, how do you think it would go down if they were to find out um, about who I am and the gifts that I bring to the office if they were to find that out during the interview? And I also have to say, you know, legally, um, a lot of uh, employers or companies will say that um, you know, the employer cannot ask you any questions about your disability. All they can really ask you questions about is, can you do the job? So if you're in a situation where you decide to disclose that you are um, an autistic person or you're a person with a different disability from autism, um, if they start to ask you questions, well, like, well, how does that, does that interfere with, but can you still, um, that's a big red flag for me. And even though, um, it's really hard to find a job when you're somebody like me, at least that's been my experience. Um, if somebody's asking me questions that make me feel like I'm not safe or they're really zeroing in on something that has no bearing on whether or not I can do the job, um, that's usually an indication to me that I probably wouldn't be happy working there. So if you are in a position where um, you know, you're in an interview that seems kind of fishy like that and you don't need that job, maybe consider asking some clarifying questions. And if it still feels off, you can say, I think I'd like to be removed from contention. So short answer, it depends on the situation, but don't work for anybody that doesn't let you live your truth and let you be the wonderful person that you are. Awesome, great answer. Um, we have two more. Are you able to hang out? I'm able to hang out for as long as you need me to. Cool. All right. So um, this is from Dalton. Thank you, Marta. Can you think back to your awareness and perspective on disabilities in general before your diagnosis? What has your journey been like since in educating yourself on disability issues and engaging with the disability community? Mm. My knowledge was very limited of the different experiences that people have in their lives when it comes to um, having a disability. So maybe that was part of the reason why I was so scared when that realization hit that this is, I might be a person who is autistic. Since that time, the thing that's really been important for me is to amplify the voices of people that we don't hear from as much as we should. 
and letting people's, letting what the other person is telling you drive the conversation. Um, there's that uh, silly statement that um, don't make assumptions, it makes an ass out of you and me. Um, it can do a lot more than make you look silly. It can actually really hurt somebody and it can, it can be a traumatic experience for somebody to constantly be exposed to people that are making decisions for them or trying to tell them what they need or even with COVID-19. I think it's been a really rude awakening that these things that we thought were not possible whenever somebody said, can, you, can we make my appointment virtual? Can I go to this class virtually? Can I work for you from home because it takes me an extra two hours to ride the bus most mornings because the bus that I'm supposed to get on is full and nobody is willing to let me get on and have my chair in there. Or um, if you're somebody who is, um, you have high anxiety uh, as a result of PTSD or another ability that you're living with and it just takes you longer in general to get from point A to point B. Knowing that um, now that all of us are working from home and working remotely and we all need this technology, it, it, it does kind, kind of leave a bad taste in your mouth when, you know, things that you might have asked for that you were told, well, we really don't have the capabilities to do that. Sorry. Now everybody has those capabilities, which is a big slap in the face to activists and disabled workers and students who asked for this stuff for years and we could have provided it at any time but because you know we had to think through logistics or not everybody needed it we assumed that it was something we didn't have to do so my hope with everything that's happened is that we will not lose this capability that schools will continue to live stream their classes for people that cannot get into the building either as the result of a physical disability or if they have anxiety related to autism or another form of a disability. Um, the Quaker organization that I work with is reporting, you know, that a lot of different Quaker communities have taken their worship services online. And I hope that continues because for years when people with disabilities would write to me and say, I can't leave my house and I can't drive to a meeting because I can't leave my house, how do I participate? there were slim pickings when it came to writing back that person and saying, well, there is this online worship. Uh, their equipment's not great, but, you know, they, they try to have it be virtual as much as they can. You know, keeping space for people that cannot participate in the same way that a lot of other people can participate, I think is going to be key. And I'm guilty of this too with, um, with nonprofit nerds because I'm the only organizer and I volunteer to do this. Um, I was never able to get anybody who would be willing to live stream our events for us, which left out a lot of people. And I have a lot of pain over that. So my, my viewpoint of um, people like me and people who have different abilities that I do not have, um, I think that having space for them and letting them dictate their experiences are the two most important things that I've learned about all of this and how to be a better advocate for you know people like me and people who are adjacent and still fighting for the same access that I'm fighting for. Another great answer. Um, I think we have one left um, from Hannah and the question is does having an official diagnosis from a doctor make it easier? Mm. That is a great question. I mean, if something shady is going down at your job, it's kind of helpful to slide that paper across the table and say, uh, please stop doing that because that's a problem. Uh, it's been helpful if, um, you know, there are loud noises in the apartment building that I live in and I need to file a complaint with the landlord, I can say, just a reminder, I, I'm, you know, I'm a tenant who is living with a disability and there are some things that make it dangerous for me here and we need to have a conversation about that. Uh, in other situations, like I'm, you know, whenever people are having awful comments about members of the disabled community or using the R word in conversations on social media, you know, me showing that piece of paper isn't going to change the fact that some people feel entitled to use that language or entitled to say that people who are disabled don't deserve the same care as other people going to hospitals right now. 
which has been really hard to hear. So in some cases, it's nice to have if I'm having a particular issue and I'm not being taken seriously. As soon as I whip out that note from my doctor that says this person has a documented disability, it's amazing how quickly people, oh, I'm so sorry, we'll, we'll get that fixed as soon as possible. But in other situations, people double down and they're like, well, I can treat you any way that I want because that's how I am. And that's not okay in any way, shape or form. So I think that um, all of us have, we have the potential to be kinder, to be more compassionate, to create space, particularly in situations like this where there are still people being left out, even though everything is virtual in many ways. Uh, there are still people who can't be on a Zoom call for eight hours a day because they have children or because that's exhausting. I'm actually working on an article right now with a friend about um, how to take in-person conferences and transform them into an innovative and accessible format so that you know people with disabilities, people with children, people who are caregivers, people that can't look at Zoom all day long so that they can be part of that experience and have an organic experience that's just not let's take this eight hour conference and make it an eight hour Zoom call because I can tell you that's not gonna do very well. So the short answer is no, it doesn't always make it easier. Sometimes it actually makes it really painful. Did you wanna have one more question, Mikey, or are we at time? Not, um, I mean, we technically listed this event until 8.30, but there are no more questions in the chat. Um, so if anyone wants to ask one uh, verbally, you can unmute and Feel free to ask Marta any questions. Um, if there's no more remaining questions, I guess we can wrap. I will take that as we're wrapping up. Um, Sounds good. Do you have anything to uh, end on? Sure. There's always the lightning round of stuff, which is uh, vaccines <laughs> do not cause autism. <laughs> uh, meltdowns are involuntary. They're not something people can control. Uh, what are some of the other things? I feel like I had more lightning round stuff the last time I gave this talk and I feel mm -hmm. crummy that I can't remember them now. Oh, um, be aware of ableist language. So I, uh, ableist language and also language that shames mental health or anybody who's experiencing mental health difficulties. Uh, I like to use the word bananas. Um, it's fun. It's tasty. Uh, there's a Gwen Stefani song that glorifies it, and it doesn't shame anybody who might be going through some stuff right now. Uh, one deep regret that I have is in earlier versions of this talk, I used a word like crippling to describe the feeling of anxiety. Um, I was lovingly corrected later that that, um, that stigmatizes people who are having physical dis uh, disabilities. So now I use different words to describe that. So the words that we have are powerful and they can either build people up or they can stigmatize and isolate. So uh, I do like to give long answers to things as we've noticed tonight, but I also like to, you know, my reference my notes again, I like to plan out what I'm doing so that I can reduce the likelihood that I'm going to be using language that might be hurtful to people or that might cause somebody to feel that they are alone and not wanted. My life's goal and life's work at this point is to create a life experience without shame and encourage other people to live without shame too. And also to create experiences where everybody feels safe and wanted. And that's why I like to give this talk is so that if there are people out there who are newly aware of their situation and are trying to get the courage to get a diagnosis or not get a diagnosis, um, that they, they feel like there's somebody out there who sympathizes and sees them and wants them to be safe and happy. And just to back up a little bit, some people do not get a diagnosis for autism because once you have it, it is noted in your medical records. And um, for some insurance companies, that's a pre-existing condition, which means it's grounds for having services denied. So if you're ever in a situation where someone says, I'm autistic, I never got diagnosed, but I'm pretty sure that I am, that is totally valid and that does not need your opinion. You just say, thank you for sharing that with me because um, 
we're all neurodiverse in the way that we process information, in the way that um, we learn things, and in the way that we share information. So autism is its spectrum, and then there's an even larger spectrum of um, how we interact with each other and how we get information out into the world. So meeting people where they're at and letting them be themselves and letting them know that they're welcome, you can't go wrong with that. Cool, thank you very much. Um, this is the second time I've asked Marty to give this presentation. Um, we always get great feedback about it. So thank you once again for um, giving this talk. Um, I'm recording right now, so I'll hope to um, post that somewhere uh, in a little bit. Um, and we'll probably send out the slides along with it when the recording is available. So um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, be sure you're signed up on our meetup um, to get our latest updates. Follow A11YPHL on Twitter. Um, use A11Y or A11YPHL as um, a hashtag. Follow Marta at Marta Rusick um, at pretty much everywhere with the exception of Facebook, which is Marta from Philly. Cool, thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good night and be safe.